Hey there, and welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. My name is Joy Rios, and on this show, we get to talk about how the complicated the U.S. healthcare system is. We typically relate it to a 30,000-piece puzzle, and each one of our guests gets to hold one of those puzzle pieces and share their expertise with our audience. Today, we have a very special number of guests, all from the health event, and I would like to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, but we're going to go in alphabetical order because there are six of you guys, seven, five, four, a lot. Well, let's start with Amanda. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Sicatelli, and I'm the Senior Director of Content Marketing at Health. When I was 10 years old, my dream job was to be a professional horseback rider. Thank you. Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea McCarthy. I'm the VP of sales at Health. And when I was 12 year, 10 years old, my dream job was to be a veterinarian. That's awesome. What about you, Jana? I'm Jana Guinan, the executive director of the Health Foundation. And when I was 10, my dream was to travel the world as a photojournalist for National Geographic. Solid dream. <laughs> what about you, Jody? I'm uh, Jody Tropiano, the head of content for health. And when I was 10, I wanted to be a host on the Today Show. Still do. Nice. Nice. Totally doable. <laughs> How about you, Maddie? Hi, I'm uh, Maddie Coffin, a senior marketing manager. And when I was 10, um, I wanted to be a doctor, but being super squeamish and fainting at the sight of blood did not pan out for me. <laughs> well, you're still in the field, so close, still close. <laughs> what about you, Mary? Yeah, hi, I'm Mary Sheridan, Director of Partnerships for Health. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to own a bakery and make the best cakes in the world. So now I just do it on the side, but. <laughs> Are you a good cook? Are you a good baker? I think I'm an okay baker, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't quit my day job and open a bakery right now, but <laughs> it awesome. does All right. How about you, Nancy? Nancy Mastriani, head of growth here at Health. Um, I actually, at the age of 10 and for many years after, I really wanted to be a lawyer and my father was a lawyer and I used to go watch him in court and I just loved watching the interaction of court and all the things that went on in the courtroom. So I was very excited, except there were way too many lawyers when I graduated college. So I opted out. I'm still that that's, I'm sure that's still a skill set that's coming like very useful to you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the health event. I am very curious and excited to go to this year's uh, event. What inspired the inception of the health event and how has its vision evolved since its beginning? It's been around since 2018. Is that correct? Yep. This is coming. We're coming into year six this year. We're extremely excited about it. Um, you know, it's really interesting when you look at health and how the story became, you know, sort of how it all evolved, you know, it was sort of, you know, how do you bring together the critical stakeholders in healthcare that used to be very siloed, the payers, the providers, the employers, life science, pharma, government, and then also some of the investor sort of ecosystem. So it was creating a community that could be highly disruptive, that brought all those stakeholders together. And it was how do we create something that makes people want to come? So it's content-driven, C-suite oriented. We put an immense amount of energy into the networking and connecting people together. How do you connect the dots so people feel like they're valued? Uh, making sure that people really have access to all aspects of the event, not sort of, hey, you get apples and I get oranges. So everybody's an equal at health. It doesn't matter whether you're a startup or you're the largest you know, sponsor at the event. So all of these pieces come together and that really sort of became the beginning vision of how health started. Um, you know, as we've evolved, obviously we've been very fortunate other than a little thing called the pandemic. Um, you know, we've seen amazing growth as far as the community. We've really seen a lot of support from each of those ecosystems. And then in addition to that, we're starting to see a lot of trending activities with, you know, sponsors who are maybe more targeting the pharma ecosystem, payers or providers who are looking for unique sponsor solutions, a lot of connectivity with programs like our hosted buyer program, 
on investors and startups with our funding founders program. I think that the evolution has just sort of like what we follow essentially the entire health innovation ecosystem. So every time that needle moves, we're moving with it. And we're really just creating that forum to create community to let showcase everybody's, you know, interests and in what the latest greatest are as far as anything from topics of thought leadership to sponsors to, hey, I want to meet the next greatest, you know, chief innovation officer. And we just, you know, we just carefully curate it all together. Of course, it's it's really wild behind the scenes, but you know, from an attendee or sponsor's perspective, we want to create a really unique journey. I mean, it must be a little bit wild behind the scenes, but like, especially with the range of attendees. So how do you all ensure that the content and the activities resonate with such a diverse audience? Yeah, definitely. We have a very diverse agenda uh, encapsulating a variety of topics across um, the entire health ecosystem. Um, and we have a diverse audience coming, whether you're a payer, provider, um, in pharma, investor, startups, patients, um, consumer brands. Um, so we really try to make it so that the event is tailored to each um, different audience coming to the event. Um, so we're creating these attendee journeys where um, depending on what topic or what kind of audience that you um, that you uh, are similar to, you can uh, pick topics and um, sessions throughout the agenda um, to kind of curate your own um, journey throughout the event, um, but also um, be able to pick some other agendas as well. So to make a customized agenda for yourself um, throughout the entire four days of the event. Um, but Jody can definitely touch on more of the topics and, and the diverse, diverse range of interests that people are coming to the event for. Yeah. Um, I, I always say to myself, we can't be everything for everyone. And we we truly can't. We have a, a limited amount of real estate on our agenda, even though we have a large agenda. Um, when you really get down to each topic, you realize there's so much more we can potentially cover, but our event would be two weeks long if we did that. Um, so we just really keep our finger on the pulse of the trends. My team follows every single healthcare newsletter out there, and you really do start to see trends on, on what's being written about, what's being spoken about on social media. We look at um, data from past events, where are our attendees spending their time, what sessions are resonating with them. And just, you know, over the years, I think we've fine-tuned our program a bit more, and we kind of know what our attendees want to hear about. And I try for each session to uh, attract a diverse mix of attendees. So if it's a session about drug development, I want to make sure that even if you're sitting at an insurance company, you still may be interested in this session. So it's, you know, there's no perfect formula for it, but over the years, I think we've gotten better at that and better at it. I mean, given the current healthcare landscape, what do you guys consider to be the most pressing issue for this year? Like what is going to be the biggest topic at this year's yeah. event? No, oh, this is pretty easy. Uh, generative AI, large language models. Um, I think probably everyone could have guessed that. We'll cover it in a lot of different ways from drug development to HR to addressing workforce shortages, really all of the use cases and potential for this technology. And then on the other side of the coin, um, the regulation of this technology, the bias within this technology, um, just kind of how fast we can go in reality and where there's still a lot of work to be done. Done. I'm so excited for that content and especially for experts to be chiming in from so many different perspectives. I feel like we're all going to learn a lot. I agree. Yeah. Um, how do you guys see the interplay between innovation? So like what's new and also traditional healthcare systems at health? Like, are there specific examples of success stories that have, have that have emerged from past events? I'll start. I mean, I think that Nancy touched on this earlier that, that with the hosted buyer program, the funding founders program. I'm, I'm going to add something later on in our conversation about patients as, as well. But 
but essentially health was really created to address innovation in healthcare, whether you're a market leader or you're just emerging with a new tech or, or you're sitting in a system that's still trying to, um, to onboard um, technologies that are more legacy. I think, you know, we're really trying to help the entire system of healthcare evolve for efficiency, um, for lower costs, for better quality and for inclusivity. Nancy, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting, you know, having been at Health from the very beginning and coming into year six, the hosted buyer program is really unique because it brings some of those critical influencers and stakeholders to the table who are looking to source that new innovation. And it's very interesting to watch kind of behind the scenes because sometimes a younger up and coming innovation, we can see trending significantly more popular with the stakeholders than a mainstream brand. So every year we look at the back end and we sort of analyze the blend of like, all the different companies participating, and then what's really trending at the top. And, you know, sometimes it's the mainstream brands that you and I all recognize and are doing really cool stuff. But every uh, every year we get a handful of surprises of companies that we've like heard interesting things about. But when you're looking at like how people want to connect with them, that they're getting an incredibly large number of requests to meet, you can see the actual data to support that all of these innovators are interested in this new innovation from company X or Y. And each year it's super exciting to watch that. I mean, I'm kind of curious about the innovation conversation too. Like, do you guys do a lot of support of tech of companies that are trying to be innovative, right? Like healthcare is one of the hardest industries to break into because we have a way of doing things the way that they've always been done. And that things have been like it's a hard system to really crack or you know, break into. Um, do you find, have you found that as a result of the health events so far that some of the innovation has like been stickier? I mean, I can say that our startup pitch competition, we've had such great success stories of the winners over the past years. Our very first startup pitch winner was the company Papa, which now is the household name in healthcare. Um, we've had the, the startup Manatee win, Particle Health, all brands that, that you know, but we're just starting out when they hit our startup stage. So I like to think that that competition moved the needle a bit. I would also add, you know, just the number of accelerators that are now present at Health, which has grown, really grown over the years. So you'll see on the show floor, a number of pavilions where accelerators are bringing their startups. And the more activity you see there, I think that the more um, likelihood that there will be traction between those, um, those startups and investors who are um, very prevalent at the event. <laughs> And one more thing, you know, and, and that kind of brings it all together with our funding founders program. Essentially, what we do is we curate matchmaking between investors who are looking to invest in startups, and they can be at various stages looking for funding. It's a straight um, sort of all people have to do is opt in. There's no additional cost. And we have a dedicated lounge with like table numbers and meeting spaces. And it's incredibly busy. But the part that's really cool about it is you get this real unique journey from the point of view of the startup and some of the innovation that they're bringing to the table. And then what really resonates with the investors. So if you're back there, you'll see a lot of activity. You'll see a lot of meetings, a lot of like ad hoc conversations. But what we're really trying to do is fuel that connection between the person looking for money and the person who has money. And, and it's amazing when people come up to you afterward to be like, thank you. That was the best meeting for my entire four days. Like, I know this is going to get me somewhere. And they share that journey with you. And then next thing you know, you're on the journey with them because you feel so emotionally connected to sort of how the conversation has evolved. And it's really cool to watch. It's got to be really gratifying. That's all. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Jenna. Go ahead. I was going to add just something else, which is um, sort of runs alongside health, but year round is our C Sweetener mentorship program, because that's another avenue where we have seen a lot of traction between founders and others in the industry. So this is a mentorship program that's year long offering for women and non-binary professionals. Again, we have many founders in the program and they can access mentors for anything from I have, this is my first time staffing an executive team to 
gosh, I don't understand the payer market, right? And so it's career development, but also many of our mentors in this program have experience as angel investors, as VCs, as startup founders themselves, as business development folks, or sitting on an innovation team in a corporate VC. So all of these kinds of opportunities from Health as the event platform to other programs like this, I think it make it very possible for innovators um, to find one another. Well, Jan, I'd like to stick with you for a second, if that's okay. So we can, mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned a minute ago about the different pavilions. And one of those, if I understand correctly, is dedicated to patient voices. And I'd love to hear more about how patient voices have become integrated into the dialogue and are helping shape the agenda. That is so important. Yes. So um, at the health event, the Health Foundation is represented there with three impact programs. And I should back up and say the foundation focuses on health equity as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion within the industry. So it's a natural place for us to kind of sit within the event hosting these impact programs. Um, so areas where we want to see real change. And so one of those programs is the Patients at Health program. It incorporates content on the impact stage. Again, it's in its own pavilion. And then a couple of special activations. Um, we actually bring, we pay to bring patients to the event as consultants. So we started this last year. It was very exciting. We had um, just a little genius bar area. It was mobbed. Um, we allow patients to, um, to connect directly with attendees. This year, that will be expanded into an entire lounge with our partner, Savvy Cooperative. And um, attendees can either sign up or drop in to consult with patients that we've brought just based on a variety of conditions that they face, life circumstances, um, impact um, and experience with clinical trials, with digital tools. So we'll be sending out signups soon. So people should watch for the signup, but that's one really important aspect of how we're bringing patients to the event and recognizing their expertise. They really are central, not just to their own healthcare, but to innovation, as we were just saying, that so many great ideas come from patients um, front and center, and we're really trying to promote that inclusion from ideation through post-commercial and, of course, in your own exam, right? So, um, so that's one thing that will happen at Patients at Health. Um, another thing I, I wanted to bring is the um, patient podcast studio that we will have. So any attendee, um, many of us are chronic patients um, and or just have had a um, you know, point in time experience as a patient that really made an impression. So we will record some of those stories and that will become a year round campaign on social media. Um, the point being that we want to see people for who they are beyond just the experience that they have when they're face to face with their providers. So that will happen as well. I love that. That is so important and so needed. And just like making a very specific like effort to make sure that the patients are being heard and part of like, especially bringing them to folks who are innovators and starting their own organizations or solutions and making sure that they are connected with the folks that it will affect ultimately is like, Bravo. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, I will say that the industry and, and uh, you know, having had past experience on the industry side in pharma, for example, I, st I think that the industry is still a little bit afraid of patients, if we're all honest, and they don't need to be. Patients have so much expertise um, and insight to offer, and healthcare just needs to be more willing to bring them in from the beginning. Well, are there any, I mean, honestly, are there any lessons learned that you had from the last year of just trying out the Genius Bar that um, helped you understand to expand that and make it more easy for people to connect with those folks? I'm, I guess, trying to dig into the why people would be afraid of patients when really we're trying to solve for them. Um, well, I mean, we are in a highly regulated industry. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll just speak from my past experience in pharma. There's just, there were just certain guardrails around um, connection to patients, right? So I think those, and I think that the kind of regulations we have make sense. They're in place for a reason. Um, but I think it's different when you're thinking about innovation and, you know, when you're trying to move the needle 
on, on quality, on efficiency, on, on empowerment, right? Which and engagement and empowerment are so important for outcomes. So, but I would say what we learned from the Genius Bar is there was a real interest, it was mobbed. And the other thing we learned is that this was a really important experience for the patients, not just for the attendees. I had um, one or two of them actually reach out and tell me that after this experience, they became certified as patient advocates, which was really amazing. Um, we had an interview with one patient who said she had never been to an event like health before, and it was so um, exciting for her to see all of the innovation and the hard work that, work that the industry is putting into change. So I, I think that there's, um, there's inspiration on both sides of this equation, and that was really exciting to see. That's really great. I mean, apart from generative AI and the patient voice, are there any other emergent topics that are, are areas of discussion that have gained prominence this year um, over compared to previous years? Uh, yes, it's been a very dynamic year. Um, so a few that will definitely be represented heavily on our program, um, GLP-1s. Everyone is talking about GLP-1s, um, the cost that this will add to our system, the misuse of the medication. So we will cover it in a few different ways, some more provocative conversations on this medication. So don't miss those sessions. Um, another would be- Wait, just the yes. for somebody who doesn't know what GLP-1s are, what are they? A, a weight loss medication mm -hmm. um, that is actually meant for diabetic patients, but it is being used for weight loss um, quite a bit. And I, there's a stat that actually really jumped out at me that if everyone who was eligible for these drugs took it, it would increase in employer spending, drug spending costs by 50%, which is pretty astronomical when employers are already being squeezed pretty hard by, by their healthcare costs. So I'm really curious to see what the next year will, will bring with these medications. Um, so there'll be a lot of conversation about them at health. And then I would say the investment landscape, it's really changed quite a bit over the last few years. Um, you know, the boom is over. So we, we need to kind of recalibrate now. We're going to be speaking about founder journeys and what it looks like to exit in this economic environment. So I think for, for a lot of startup founders, there'll be a lot of impactful conversations on what they can expect. Um, other than that, I mean, there, there's a lot of new sessions that we're trying. Um, I was really struck by the statistic that came out in the beginning of this year around our life expectancy in the U.S. declining yet again compared to other developed nations. We have the most innovative R&D in the world. We spend the most in the world, and yet we're still dying younger than our counterparts in, in other countries. So just digging into why this is the case, um, you know, how we're focusing mostly on chasing symptoms, on sick care. So we'll be focusing a lot on preventative health and what we can do from a cost perspective, from an access perspective to increase our ability to spread these preventative health services across our populations. We're really good at coming up with this technology, but we're not very good at distributing it to people who need it. So that's what we'll chat about throughout the agenda. And a couple as well from the Health Foundation perspective. Um, we've been talking about mental health for a while. We've been talking about maternal outcomes and disparities in outcomes by race. Um, I think this year there have been a few very prominent cases um, around postpartum depression and the real um, gap in services, particularly for everybody, but particularly for um, women of color who don't seem to be connected um, soon enough when there's a crisis. So that's one that's really um, that, that really stands out to me. I would say as well that um, we are seeing a change in the um, employability, I guess, of DEI officers, which were, and they were many of them, and, and chief health equity officers when there was a, a run to hire them during the pandemic. So um, this shift and, and what it really means is another thing. And then I would say, thirdly, we are firmly in a post jobs world. So um, I will tell you that on the Women at Health Luncheon agenda, we'll be thinking about that. What is the vision for inclusive reproductive care? Why we all should care about it? And then how employers and individuals um, can advocate for change. I was listening to a Politico um podcast recently it was only seven minutes long but it talked about maternal deserts and you know the stats were actually from before the pandemic and even then of like women not having access to reproductive care 
was already pretty horrific. And so the new post jobs is just to make it exponentially worse. So we definitely have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that people have the care that they need where they need it. Um, speaking of that, I mean, there's a lot going on in the US, but what about healthcare challenges globally? Does there an international like perspective or best practices from other countries that somehow gets incorporated into the health event? And Mary, we haven't heard much from you. I'm going to point that at you. Yeah, sure. So um, absolutely. So health is in a unique position as a convener um, where, you know, health impacts, health and wellness impacts every single person um, globally, um, even if it looks differently, depending on where you live. So we know we have a unique responsibility to address that where appropriate. Um, Jody and her team does a fantastic job of weaving where appropriate um, speakers that um, you know, are multinational and, you know, operating globally. So a lot of that does those trends and those insights do get, I think, naturally woven into the conversation, Jody, um, if I'm not wrong. Um, but we also do focus on um, trying to pull in through other, especially partners, um, some curated sessions where um, Sunday of this year, our um, long uh, partner, ACH Alliance, is hosting a kind of digital health trend summit that they've done previously um, at Health. So we're, we're just expanding upon that. Um, and then also new this year, we're launching the Global Health Connector Village, where we've had in the past and we'll continue this year to have some of our larger um, accelerators. So we have one from uh, Australia, Australia and Health is coming and they're bringing a whole group of um, Australian startups, um, as well as um, uh, Israel um, and the UK are also bringing their startups. So we do get that crossover of startups that are looking to break into the US markets where a lot of our content is, is relevant for them. Um, but this village this year will also have its own content. They'll be specific to those um, international companies. They'll be um, looking to break into the US market, um, which is also kind of a nice segue to the launch of our Health Europe event, which will be June next year, June 2024 um, in Amsterdam. So um, really, as Jody said, we can't be everything to ever everyone in one conference. So it made sense that we are a convener and a lot of our delegates do come from overseas to kind of take it to them too, but with a different perspective that um, maybe it's also for U.S. companies looking to break into the European markets um, overseas, and then also the unique challenges that healthcare represents for um, those in those countries outside the U.S. So um, a lot of that is starting to commingle this year at Health 23, um, and will just only be kind of expand and grown upon in the two events um, in 2024. That is so exciting. Like that honestly. So all right, you've got how many events in its health, vive, health again. No, there's more. What am I missing? Health US, October 8th to 11th, 2023. We have Vive, um, which will be 2024, end of February, February 26th to 28th. Guys, that right? Yeah. Um, in Los Angeles and then Health Europe, um, June. 11th? 20th to 24th? Right? It's 24th. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Um, in Amsterdam. So it'll be kind of a three event cadence um, with five in the beginning of the year, Health Europe in the middle, and then Health uh, US to kind of kick everything off from everything you've seen uh, um, at the beginning of the year um, towards the end. So that kind of leads to my next question around like post event. How do you make sure that these conversations and partnerships and ideas that are forged during the event continue? But it sounds like that's actually part of the plan. But feel free to expand, um, yeah. Amanda or Maddie, sure. either. Yeah. So we capture all the amazing session content that Jody and her team and Jana put together for each event each year. We basically repurpose that in our marketing team into bite-sized pieces in the form of videos, blogs, inspirational quotes, eBooks, newsletters, podcasts, and photos. And we get that out all year round in our very, very busy content calendar for marketing. So our goal on the marketing team is to consistently serve up fresh content through thought leadership content. So, um, you know, coming from our roster of senior healthcare executives, we want that content to inspire people, educate people, as well as entertain them. Um, and we want that to happen all year round, anywhere they are online, whether they're on social media, email, um, YouTube, you, you name it. Um, we want to make sure that we're in front of them. Um, 
So every day our audiences are getting new content and they're never bored with us. And they're never wondering like, why haven't we heard from the health brand lately? Cause we're constantly talking to them and we're not, you know, selling to them and promoting We're We're actually sharing valuable content to them to get them interested in our brand and then to eventually, you know, get interested in becoming a customer. Um, I think our goal on market, the marketing team is really to create FOMO. If anyone doesn't know what that means, fear of missing out. So, you know, if you watch us on social media, you think like that looks like an amazing experience. I want to be a part of that. Um, so that's really what we aim to do all year round, not just those four days of the event. Are you good? Quick question. Are you guys on TikTok yet? We aren't yet, but it's I think- the scariest we might... one. It's the scariest yeah. one. <laughs> it is scariest. It's so intimidating. But I think that once you get over there, it actually turns into a lot of fun. So I'd say, you know, take the leap if you if you can. It's it's a good time <laughs> and a fun way to like in to bring in um to bring in comedy to it. Right. Looking forward, I mean you guys have already sort of planned your the future, like continuing conversations into the future with the future events. So can we talk about what it is that you're looking forward to? What are the events um after health? Yeah, so we have Vive coming up, which is all focused on the business side of health care technology. So all the great things and technology and innovations that you saw at Health US in October um, will all be out. How do we implement it? How do we get reimbursed for it? How do we pay for it? So um, all that will be happening at five in Los Angeles, February 25th through 28th, 2024. Um, and then again, we'll be launching Health Europe in Amsterdam, June 17th to the 20th in 2024. Um, and then again, Health US in, in October, uh, again, 2024. So Thank you. And one last question. So for anybody who has never been, we've been talking about this event as if like folks have been and have the full experience, but for a first time attendee, what are the must attend sessions or activities that, sh that shouldn't be missed? Health creates a unique marketplace for the health community. And we've really led the way for this. So we highly encourage attendees to truly immerse themselves in all aspects of the event, including all of our networking opportunities, our great content and programming and our night receptions. We'll have an interactive mobile app that will launch a few weeks prior to the event, which makes for seamless networking. Uh, we have our affinity meetups at health, including Black at Health, Pride at Health, Latino at Health, and Asian American Pacific Islander at Health, which focuses on the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also offer our insights programming, including pharma and life sciences, pharma, uh, payers, and transformative health leaders, which is for, for physician executives. Uh, focusing on relevant information for these audiences. And we offer curated receptions at night, including our welcome reception, innovators reception, happy hours, uh, and industry night receptions, which are great ways for attendees to see old friends and colleagues and meet some new ones. It is going to be a jam-packed week. I'm so excited. And I really like, I want to say thank you to all of you for all of the work that you have put into this and to make this thing real and grow and live the way that it is living. It definitely feels vibrant. It definitely feels innovative. And it has a flavor that is slightly different than what we get in healthcare, which is not traditional. So I really, really appreciate that. And I love that all of the, the great work that you guys are doing. So if anybody wants to get involved or follow, attend, or even connect with you, how would you recommend they do so? And I know we've, we've got um, quite the crew. So let's go back in alphabetical order. If somebody wanted to connect with you, um, Amanda, how, how would they do so? I'm sure you're all on LinkedIn, but. <laughs> Every social media platform everywhere, even TikTok. Um, okay. <laughs> video on TikTok. No, but um, they can connect with me on LinkedIn. So if you just search Amanda Sicatelli, um, you know, I'd be happy to connect with you there. Wonderful. Andrea? Um, I can be reached at Andrea at hlth.com. Uh, I'm also Andrea McCarthy on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you. Jana, you're alphabetically next. 
Yes. So for Health Foundation, anyone can reach out to info at HLTH Foundation and it's a dot org. Wonderful. Jody? I would say uh, LinkedIn. So just Jody Tropiano on LinkedIn. I'm not the greatest at LinkedIn messages, so please bear with me, but um, I will answer eventually. All right. Maddie? Yeah, same here. Um, you can just search for me, Maddie Coffin, on LinkedIn and feel free to reach out. For Mary Sheridan, you guys can um, shoot me an email at mary, M-A-R-Y, at hlth.com or uh, feel free to search for me for Mary Sheridan at LinkedIn. Love to always connect. Thank you. And Nancy. Uh, I am nancy at hlth.com. One other thing is you can hit our general mailbox. If anybody's just like, I don't know who to email, it's info at hlth.com. And you will always find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Ladies, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to seeing you all in person very, very soon. And just want to say thanks again. This has been great.